you already know whether or not this will be a good talk. Social psychologist Nalini Mbadi conducted a study in which she gave students three 10 second video clips of a teacher with the sound turned off. She then had the students evaluate the teacher's effectiveness based just on those 10 second clips. Her findings showed that the teacher evaluations made at the end of the course closely matched the evaluations made in those first 10 seconds. So again, you already know whether or not this will be a good talk. <laughs> You've already decided. But what if our expectations didn't just predict reality, but created it? This idea has implications for all of us, but it's especially true in our schools. Educational researcher Dr. John Hattie published a massive international study, including over 1,200 meta-analyses, containing over 50,000 studies with a student population size of over 80 million. In his research, he examined just under 200 influences impacting student achievement using a common measure called effect size. He found that an effect size of 0.4 was equivalent to making one year's growth in a year. Here are just a few of the influences Hattie studied and their accompanying effect size. Now you can see some of these are outside of a school's control. Things like home environment and socioeconomic status, both of which have an effect size of 0.57, meaning just those things alone, the home environment, the socioeconomic status will lead to over a year's worth of growth before a student even walks into the door. Other things are within a school's control. Other things are within a classroom control. You see some things like homework has an effect size of 0.29. Mobility has an effect size of negative 0.34. So what Hattie found in his research was that almost everything leads to improvement, but some things much more than others. So the question is not what leads to improvements in student achievement, but what impacts student achievement most so we can concentrate our efforts there. So what's at the top? Well, of the nearly 200 influences Hattie studied, the number one influence with an effect size of 1.62, which is equivalent to the potential of unlocking nearly four years worth of growth in a year, teacher estimates of student achievement. Teachers' estimates of the abilities of their students had an impact on the actual level of achievement that they received. This is both exciting and terrifying. We wield enormous power in our expectations because when we project our expectations onto our students day in and day out consistently, eventually our students start to believe us and they start to adopt those expectations of themselves. Because what's intriguing here is that while teacher estimates of student achievement had the highest effect size, another influence closely following with an effect size equivalent to unlocking nearly three years worth of growth with student expectations of themselves. Students achieve at the level they expect of themselves. So we have these two super influences here, teacher estimates of student achievement and student expectations of themselves and these two things woven together have the potential to unlock enormous growth in our students and can be the catalyst to great change in our schools. But this isn't just about our schools. How does this idea apply to you? What do you expect from the people around you? What do you expect from the people you work with? From the people you lead? What do you expect from yourself? And if our expectations create reality, then what is the reality we are co-creating here? Are we satisfied? My friends, I believe our world is desperate for a new creation. In my work, I see children, adolescents, teenagers crying out 
for new expectations. Not just higher expectations, but expectations of greater depth. So what do we do with this information? How do we identify our expectations? How do we monitor them? And when necessary, how do we change them? Well, I have three ideas for you to consider. Number one, protect your lens. Low expectations is a black hole that pulls you in so slowly you don't even know you're being crushed nor that you're crushing those you're intended to serve. Now this slow pull of low expectations can look different in different organizations and different environments, but at a school it might look something like this. It's near the end of a year, one teacher approaches another and may say something like, I hear you're getting Johnny next year. Well, let me tell you about Johnny. Johnny is lazy. Johnny's got nothing coming for him at home. Johnny just doesn't want to learn. It's almost as if this teacher says, here, I see this student through a lens of low expectations and I'm going to pass it along to you. And too often, we accept it. Do not. Avoid those conversations where the seeds of low expectations are planted. Avoid the locations where those conversations take place and when possible, avoid the people who spread those seeds. Two, a challenge for you. The next time you see a teenager walking down the street, perhaps with a shock of bright purple dyed hair hanging over their face, perhaps with a lot of tattoos or piercings, or perhaps, God forbid, with their pants hanging a few inches lower than their waistline. Stop and take a moment. Move any snap judgments and preconceived notions from the shadows of mindlessness and into the light of awareness. Observe them and then exchange them with something new and beautiful. Now there's a term for this for this observation of one's own thoughts, for the shine, shining a light onto your own awareness. It's called mindfulness. Practice mindfulness. Now, unfortunately, this term mindfulness is being thrown around and used so often today that some might consider it just another passing fad that will come and go. It's not. Just because something is new to us doesn't mean that it's new. Mindfulness has been around for thousands of years in a variety of different terms or whatever you want to call it. Mindfulness is the strengthening of our muscles of awareness and observations. At the school I work, our teachers are, com are currently completing an eight-week course on mindfulness and meditation so that they can become more aware of their own observations, their own habits of mind, their own implicit biases, so that they can be better teachers, so that they can be better humans. This is something that any organization can do, but you don't have to wait for this to be set up for you. It's a practice that you can seek on your own. And finally, consider this. If I were to say to you, Black people these days are lazy. That would be shockingly racist. And I would hope and assume that someone would stand up and speak out against me. If I were to say to you, women these days are lazy, that would be sexist. And I would hope someone would confront me and speak truth to me. If I were to say to you, kids these days are lazy, what would the response be? Would it be different? I would hope that someone would speak out against me, but I'm afraid they might not. In some of the conversations or situations where a kids these days type of statement has been made, there's sometimes been silent consent or even outright agreement. Somehow this ageism or more specifically, this youthism has become socially acceptable. Reject youthism. Reject 
any generalization about low expectations about any young person. Because if you know one child, one adolescent, one teenager who doesn't meet that definition, then the statement is false. I work in an alternative high school, a high school full of kids who have often been cast aside with some of these negative youthist labels of low expectations. And I'll tell you, I certainly know kids that don't meet that definition. So let me tell you about kids these days. Some of the kids I know. Kids these days are amazing. Kids these days are extraordinary. Kids these days are passionate. Kids these days are creative. Kids these days are inspiring. Do you see it? You may have to look close. You may have to cast aside your assumptions, your generalizations, your projections. You may have to cast aside the labels you may have based on the appearance, the clothes they wear, the style of their hair, the complexion of their skin. Look close. You have to look close enough you have to be close enough to look them in the eye. If you do, you may see something beautiful. If you look close enough, you may see divinity. Perhaps, if you look close enough, you may see yourself. Examine the story you tell about the world around you, about the children and young adults in our schools and in our lives. Shine a light into yourself, into your own consciousness, into the darkest corners of your soul. Because in order to change our schools, our organizations, in order to change our communities, our nation, we first have to change ourselves. <laughs>